Hello friends, today we're going to be studying the topic of finality in Islam. Often referred to as the problem of the seal of the prophets, which is that from an Islamic perspective, the prophet Muhammad is the final messenger of God unto humankind, that no religion or revelation will come after the prophet Muhammad. This is looked at both from the Quran itself, where it says that the Prophet Muhammad is the seal of the Prophets, meaning he hath sealed this and closed it. Secondly, we have the issue of the Hadith, where it seems very clear from the sayings of the Prophet Muhammad that he is the last Prophet. So it's not just the seal, but it's also qualified by statements from the sayings of the Prophet Muhammad that he is the last Prophet of God unto humankind. We're going to look at this through a series of videos, so please understand that a true understanding from my perspective of this topic as it relates to the Baha'i Faith will actually necessitate a series of investigations to, if you will, explore this picture more fully from the Quran and from the Baha'i writings. I've seen many different answers to this topic within the Baha'i world. And one of the things I want to state up front so that there is not a misunderstanding between uh, myself and any Muslim viewers, is that the Baha'i writings themselves are very clear that the Prophet Muhammad is the seal of the Prophets. Not only that, that the Prophet Muhammad is himself the last Prophet before the Day of God. If you will, the Yom Adin, the Day of Ingathering, the End Times. I want to begin here with a couple quotes from Baha'u'llah on this issue. In truth I say, on this day the blessed words, but he is the apostle of God and the seal of the prophets, have found their consummation in the verse, the day when mankind shall stand before the Lord of the worlds. Render thou thanksgiving unto God for so great a bounty. In this quote Baha'u'llah is stating, true or not, that the Prophet Muhammad is the Apostle of God and the seal of the Prophets, and that this issue, this topic, this concept has found its consummation in this day, when mankind shall stand before the Lord of the Worlds. Once again, it's important to understand that from a Baha'i perspective, it is not that the Prophet Muhammad isn't the last Prophet before the Day of God, it's that the Day of God has actually come. Now, next quote. It is evident that every age in which a manifestation of God hath lived is divinely ordained, and may in a sense be characterized as God's appointed day. This day, however, is unique, and is to be distinguished from those that have preceded it. The designation Seal of the Prophets fully revealeth its high station. The prophetic cycle hath verily ended. The eternal truth is now come. He hath lifted up the ensign of power, and is now shedding upon the world the unclouded splendor of his revelation. Thou art he by whose name the hidden secret was divulged, and the well-guarded name was revealed, and the seal of the sealed-up goblet were opened, shedding thereby its fragrance over all creation, whether of the past or of the future. He who was a thirst, O my Lord, hath hastened to attain the living waters of thy grace, and the wretched creature hath yearned to immerse himself beneath the ocean of thy riches. Several themes appear in these second two quotes. One is that the designation, the seal of the prophets, revealeth the high station of this day. It is stated clearly that the prophetic cycle hath verily ended, and the eternal truth is now come. The claim once again is that the Prophet Muhammad was the seal of the prophets, that he was the last prophet of God unto humankind before the great day. The second, it talks of how these sealed up goblets were opened, referencing that revelation was sealed and has now been opened. So we're going to put this aside for a moment because many of these themes actually appear directly from the Quran. 
what I wish to just simply summarize in this point is, the Baha'i writings themselves never claim that the Prophet Muhammad is not the last Prophet, nor is he the seal of the Prophets. Instead, the claim is actually that there was a prophetic cycle that ended with the Prophet Muhammad prior to the coming of the Great Day of God. And it's important to understand that this, when you look at the Qur'an and the Hadith themselves, that actually in the Day of God, there are Prophets. <laughs> Jesus himself comes. And you actually have these prophetic figures appearing before the Lord of the Worlds, on the Day of Resurrection. So it's not that no Prophets can, can or will come after the Prophet Muhammad, Rather, the issue is whether or not that event of the Great Day of God is itself self-evident and obvious, or does it actually have to be investigated? This is a theme we're going to return to several times. For now, I want to state that we're going to turn particularly to the Qur'an itself. The Qur'an, no matter what the Hadith say, must be in the end the ultimate authority on what God wished to communicate to humankind. This should seem obvious, <laughs> because the Hadith themselves were collected by individuals. In these cases, century to centuries after, where actually the statements of the Prophet Muhammad, regardless of Hadith sciences, and the attempts to verify and back them up by chains of narrators, what God revealed unto humankind was the Quran, as that holy authentic, holy authoritative, definitive statement on what Islam has to say. The same goes for Islamic tradition of understanding regarding doctrine and concepts within the Quran, or sorry, within Islam. I cannot go by Islamic tradition and Islamic understandings and Islamic interpretation any more than a Muslim would themselves find, feel themselves beholden to follow Christian traditional interpretation. They should, if you will look at the, the one video we have on the authenticity of the Bible in the Quran, they should actually hold themselves beholden to the New Testament or to the Old Testament, but to actually have a Muslim agree that they should be bound, for example, by the Council of Nicaea, which happened in the 4th century, no Muslim would ever actually accept this. The same as well goes for any Christian. They will hold themselves beholden unto the Torah, unto the prophets of the Old Testament, but do not believe that they have to be bound by the interpretations of the Jewish community. So we take the Quran itself as obviously above the Hadith, and the Quran obviously above the historical understandings and interpretations of the Islamic community. This doesn't mean we don't have to consider them, yet they cannot bind us that, well, this is how Islam has been seen for this long. Because of course, a Christian would say to a Muslim, Okay, well, obviously you're wrong on this point because this is actually how Christianity has seen itself for this period of time. And then the Christian would have to turn to the Jewish individual and hear the same thing. Well, you can't be correct because this is actually how rabbinical or pharisaical Judaism has seen things for this long. I want to do as best as I can to really, really, truly look at the Qur'an and what it says primarily. And of course, given this is a Baha'i deepening, we're going to look at a series of Baha'i quotes, but try to show how these are really echoing themes that appear within the Qur'an itself. Some of these sections um, are going to look at the Arabic itself, which I can read. Yet at the same time, I'm not assuming everyone can read Arabic in order to go through this. I want to begin, before we jump into the Qur'an itself, with one quote from Baha'u'llah, from the Seven Valleys, and this is from the Valley of Search. The true seeker hunteth not but the object of his quest, and the lover hath no desire save union with his beloved. 
nor shall the seeker reach his goal unless he sacrifice all things. That is, whatever he has seen and heard and understood, all must he set at naught, that he may enter the realm of the Spirit, which is the city of God. Labor is needed if we are to seek him. Ardor is needed if we are to drink of the honey of reunion with him. And if we taste of this cup, we shall cast away the world. On this journey the traveler abideth in every land and dwelleth in every region. In every face he seeketh the beauty of the friend. In every country he looketh for the beloved. He joineth every company and seeketh fellowship with every soul, that haply in some mind he may uncover the secret of the friend, or in some face he may behold the beauty of the loved one. I bring up this quote because Baha'u'llah speaks of a seeker, one who is hunting his beloved, and gives this concept of labor, of ardor, of search, of traveling in every land to find the beauty of the beloved. What often happens when I read these quotes is I think back to those first souls in the early history of any revelation who in order to find their beloved had to break with tradition, had to seek and think anew concerning the possibility of God's revelation unto humankind. How a Muslim, sorry, how an Arabian man or woman in Saudi Arabia in the seventh century would have to turn from their own heritage, whether the Baha'i faith is true or not, this is what happened. They would have to turn from their own heritage, their own background, and put the object of their quest, their beloved, above the traditions and historical interpretations and understandings of their community. Any Christian from a Muslim perspective would have had to have done this. And likewise, any Roman centurion, any Pharisee, any Sadducee, any Jewish individual would have had to have put aside their own historical interpretations and understandings and seek anew and put the object of their quest, the union with their beloved, above their own community's understandings. Even if we were to go back further and further and we were to look at some individual who, for example, had listened to the teachings of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or of Joseph within the Old Testament, who suddenly met with the revelation and teachings of Moses, surely would have seen them as different from what they had known. Yet they themselves, just like the Jew to the Christian, to the Christian to the Muslim, and potentially the Muslim to the Baha'i, would have to set aside the historical understandings and make truly the beauty of the friend what they're seeking. Before we enter, as I said, there's going to be aspects of Arabic within this study. In this case, it's important to understand how Arabic is formed. So, for example, in English, we have the words to collect, or collection, or collector, or collectible. There is a common root in each of them, just like in to decide, to be decisive, decision, or indecision. There's a, there's a core root to that, th those words from which all the other ones are derived. Arabic itself is a triliteral la root language, which means you'll have, in the vast, vast, vast majority of cases, you'll actually have three letters. That from these three letters, there are different forms that, from which you get new words. Um, the example I wanted to use is actually the letters in English, obviously, K, K, T, T, and B. But, so, from these three letters, we get kataba, which is to write. We also get kitab, which is a book or a thing that's been written. We have katib, once again, k, t, and b, katib, and we get, for example, a writer or a scribe, or we have maktaba, you have an 
M at the beginning of that word, but the maktaba, uh, this would be, for example, a library or a place where books are found. So it's important to understand this because when we're looking at the Quran, um, there really is a challenge because if you begin looking in the Quran from the English translations, well, a translator can actually take, uh, for example, a word like, I don't know, kitab. And he might say, translate this as a book in one case and scroll as another. But in the Arabic itself, the word is, a, is, is identical. The same thing happens, for example, in translations of the Old Testament from Hebrew to English or from Greek uh, into English for the New Testament. You'll have actually the same word who, uh, and not for any nefarious reasons, uh, translators have actually taken and, and they've given different translations of it in English, although if a you know, individual who was reading Greek was reading them, they would see this as the same word. So what are we doing? We're taking a study of the Quran, in this case, from the root letters themselves and trying to understand all different, sorry, understand to collect all different forms of that work or word um, based upon the Arabic root. So if we want to understand what collecting is, we want to look at how that word collector, collector, collection, collectible, or to collect are used within this, 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 this work, the Quran, based from the Arabic. And this is important because very often, understandably, we can actually take our, our sort of cultural background understanding to a text because we see a word that we ourselves are familiar with. The example I, I often use, which is sort of ridiculous, is that some individual who's reading, for example, Karl Marx, and they hear Karl Marx writing about false consciousness. And when they culturally think of false consciousness, in, in our day, they actually think of a zombie. So they think that Karl Marx is actually talking about a zombie apocalypse when he's really actually talking about false consciousness that has been bred into the community and actually as a state of being of, if you will, the proletariat. Um, it's really important because as we're going to see through this study of uh, the seal, as well as others that come, it's very, very common for people to bring their cultural background to the understanding of that text. What we have to do is actually treat Karl Marx in his use of false consciousness, his writings actually as the dictionary itself to understand, well, what did he really mean? What did he mean by that term? Likewise with the Quran, we want to take the Quran itself first and foremost as the ultimate authority on the words that it uses. So how can one do this? Um, just so you know, I'm actually using a concordance of the Quran by uh, Hannah Cassis, and this work can be found online, and you can find uh, root search engines online where you can go into the Quran and try and say, well, what does this word mean? What is, this, what is the Quran trying to convey in this case? You can look at its triliteral root, you can then take a collection of all the times it's used and try and do your best to understand it. Um, so this here is a study of the, the Arabic root, khatama, uh, kha, ta, and ma, in the sounds of to seal. So what will we be looking at? We'll be looking at khatama, which is to seal something or to set a seal. Uh, we can look at khatim, which is a seal, a noun. Um, you can have different things that something is being sealed, is sealing, we're generally really taking the collection of this word, this root, from the Quran and trying to make it the, the core of our study. So when the Quran states that Prophet Muhammad is the seal of the prophets, what does this mean? Okay, so what is the text itself? We're going to look, for example, first at the quote in question. And this is from the Quran in Surah or chapter 33. And we're looking at verses 38 to 40. No blame shall be attached to the prophet for doing what is sanctioned for him by God. Such was the way of God with those who went before him, who fulfilled the mission with which God had charged them, fearing God 
and fearing none besides him. Sufficient is God's reckoning. Muhammad is the father of no man among you. He is the apostle of God and the seal of the prophets. Surely God has knowledge of all things. So it is here in verse 40 of this chapter or surah that we have this statement. He is the apostle of God and the seal of the prophets. Khatam and Nabi'in. So that Khatam is the seal. Khatam. At this point, it's simply saying he is the apostle of God and the seal of the prophets. Our goal in this section of this study is to try to understand what that word actually means independent of historical interpretations, and for the time, independent of any other Islamic traditions or Islamic texts. So we're going to move first here to the Quran. I'm going to say chapter and verse instead of surah and ayat. Um, chapter 2, verses 6 to 7. As for the unbelievers, alike it is to them, whether thou hast warned them or hast not warned them, they do not believe. God has set a seal on their hearts and on their hearing, and on their eyes is a covering, and there awaits them a mighty chastisement. It seems very clear that seal means something that has been closed, something that has been shut up. Um, why God does this? This is a separate theme in the Quran, we'll have to study it at a different time and what this means of God doing this. Yet regardless, no matter what we do, the eyes are sealed, the ears are sealed. They are closed up and shut. And God has done this. We're going to jump quickly to Quran, chapter 6, verses 42 to 47. Indeed, we sent to nations before thee, and we seized them with misery and hardship, that haply they might be humble. If only when our might came upon them, they had been humble, but their hearts were hard, and Satan decked out fair to them what they were doing. So when they forgot what they were reminded of, we opened unto them the gates of everything, until when they rejoiced in what they were given, we seized them suddenly, and behold, they were sore confounded. So the last remnant of the people who did evil was cut off. Praise belongs to God, the Lord of all being. Say, what think you? If God seizes your hearing and sight and sets a seal upon your hearts, who is a God other than God to give it back to you? Behold how we turn about the signs, yet thereafter they are running away. Say, what think you? If God's chastisement comes upon you, suddenly or openly, shall any be destroyed except the people of the evildoers. And it states, what think you if God seizes your hearing your sight, takes away your hearing and your sight, and sets a seal upon your heart, who is a God other than God that can give it back to you? So this sounds very much like the passage before. It, it is a sealing of the heart. And given the context, it sounds very clearly that it is actually a closing off of the heart, a shutting of the heart. Yet at the same time, there's a different facet of this quote. It says, And sets a seal upon your hearts, who is a God other than God to give it back to you? So it can be opened. God can seal something, and it can be fully sealed, the heart in this case, and maybe the eyes and the ears, yet those seals can be opened, or if you will, taken off. Um, and this is important because it seems like, as I said at the beginning, that there is a seal of the prophets where um, God has sealed prophethood. But there seems to be individuals that come after that event in the day of God. However, we're going to put that aside again for now. Quran, chapter 36, verses 60 to 65. Sons of Adam. Did I not charge you never to worship Satan, your acknowledged foe, but to worship me? Surely that is a straight path. Yet he has led a multitude of you astray. Had you no sense? 
This is the hell you have been promised. Burn in it this day on account of your unbelief. On that day we shall seal their mouths, their hands will speak to us, and their very feet will testify to their misdeeds. So it's here in actually verse 65 that we have this concept of a seal on their mouths. And again, remember that we have this concept of closing. He shall seal their mouth so their hands will speak to us and their feet will testify to their misdeeds, which means they cannot testify through their mouths. Once again, very clear that it's closing. It doesn't have this notion that that actually can be taken off in this theme. Yet it does have this idea where one thing is sealed, which is the mouth, yet the testimony or the speaking comes a different way. Okay, so we have it, a seal means to be closed, yet God can remove such seals. And even when one thing is sealed, another means of communication can happen. This hand speaking to us and their te- feet testifying to their deeds. That is the bounty whereof God gives glad tidings to his servants who believe and do righteous deeds. Say, No reward do I ask of you for this, except the love of those near of kin. And if anyone earns any good, we shall give him an increase of good in respect thereof. For God is oft forgiving, most ready to appreciate the service. What do they say? He has forged a falsehood against God? But if God willed, he could seal up thy heart. And God blots out vanity and proves the truth by his words, for he knows well the secrets of all hearts. He is the one that accepts repentance from his servants and forgives sins, and he knows all that ye do. And he listens to those who believe and do deeds of righteousness, and gives them increase of his bounty. But for the unbelievers, theirs is a terrible penalty. It seems very clear that this is the same theme, that it is actually being closed or covered, so it cannot properly work anymore. We're going to jump ahead. What do those who seek after evil ways think that we shall hold them equal with those who believe and do righteous deeds, that equal will be their life and their death? Ill is the judgment that they make. God created the heavens and the earth for just ends, and in order that each soul may find the recompense of what it has earned, and none of them be wronged. Then seest thou such a one as takes as his God his own vain desire? God has, knowing him as such, left him astray, and sealed his hearing and his heart and understanding and put a cover on his sight. Who then will guide him after God has withdrawn guidance? Will ye not then receive admonition? So God has left him astray, sealed his hearing and his heart, and put a cover on his sight. So an individual who actually chooses their vain desires as They are God instead of God. God will seal their heart and seal their hearing. Okay? And then it says, Who then will guide him after God? Will he not then receive admonition? This is the theme we saw in the second quote, which is God places a seal upon the heart and upon the hearing of someone so that it is closed. Undeniably meaning it is shut It is closed, it has ended, yet it states, who then will guide him after God? Meaning, God can pull that seal off. He can take the seal off the hearing, he can take the seal off the heart. This is the same definition of sealing that we had in the second case, in the second quote that we looked at. And it seems obvious to me that in each of the cases, the seals that God places on, he can actually take off. That it is shut up for a time based on a certain condition. We're now going to look at the sixth and seventh instance of this Arabic root from Khatama 
to seal or to be sealed. Truly the righteous will be in bliss. On thrones of dignity will they command a sight of all things. Thou wilt recognize in their faces the beaming brightness of bliss. Their thirst will be slaked with pure wine sealed. The seal thereof will be musk. And for this let those who aspire, who have aspirations. With it will be given a mixture of tasneem, a spring from the waters whereof drink those nearest to God. Those in sin used to laugh at those who believed, and whenever they passed by them, used to wink at each other in mockery. And when they returned to their own people, they would return jesting. And whenever they saw them, they would say, Behold, these are the people truly astray. But they had not been sent as keepers over them. But on this day, the believers will laugh at the unbelievers. On thrones of dignity, they will command a sight of all things. Will not the unbelievers have been paid back for what they did? I suggest individuals actually read this uh, passage several times and look at the context um, of, uh, sorry, chapter 83. This is talking about in this day, the righteous will be in bliss. They're sitting on thrones of dignity. You can recognize their faces, this beaming brightness. And this is the day of God. This, this is the end times. This is actually the day that the Prophet Muhammad is speaking of. And that all the prophets prior to Prophet Muhammad have been speaking of. The day of God, the day of judgment, that time when humanity will be brought together under the justice and light of the divine world. It states that you'll see these uh, the righteous ones in bliss, on thrones of dignity, commanding a sight. Their faces are beaming. And then what does it say? Their thirst will be slaked with pure wine sealed. Maktum. That's at Khatama. So it is, they have been sealed. And the Khitam, the, the actual seal itself is musk. And for this, let those aspire who have aspirations. So imagine this picture, you actually have the righteous in bliss and for sure their thirst is slaked with pure wine that's been sealed. And in this case, if they're drinking it, the, the seal has been removed. So in the day of God, the seal has been removed and they're actually drinking this pure wine. Interestingly, wine, which is forbidden within Islam, but this is the wine of reunion with God. A subject treated in much Islamic poetic literature and within the Baha'i writings as well. The important issue here is you actually have a seal that has been removed in order. The seal itself is musk and for this let those aspire who have aspirations. So there's a pure wine that we should be aspiring to. Something that we should be longing for and trying to get Obviously, in this context, because these are the righteous who are sitting on thrones of dignity, their faces beaming with brightness, the brightness of bliss, that we wish to be on those thrones as a, as, as a, as a lover of the Quran and as a lover of God and the Prophet Muhammad. We want to be on those thrones. We want to be with our faces beaming with brightness, and we want to be drinking this wine. We want to be able to unseal the wine and taste of its draft. What do we find about the meaning of seal within this context itself? Uh, it's very, very similar in that the seal is something that closes up. It is something that has been shut and closed. In this case, the seal can be removed by the righteous ones in the day of God. So barring any other interpretations of how this might relate, what does the term seal mean? Because we have actually now come to the end of all instances in the Quran of this Arabic root. We've looked at to seal, a seal that is put on, something being sealed, the verb to seal. We've actually exhausted the instances in the Quran of this term. What does it mean? <laughs> 
It means something that for sure closes. It completely shuts. Like the ears of the wicked, the eyes of the wicked, the hearts of the wicked, the wine. It's actually something that has shut and closed it off. So there's no doubt that this is actually the meaning of seal. And we're trying to, as best we can, take the Quran itself as the authority in understanding what this means. It doesn't mean we can't actually look at other interpretations and other understandings from the Islamic community, but what does it mean if we're using the Quran as its own dictionary to unravel its meaning? We find that seal, based on the Arabic root, from the Quran does mean being sealed, but a seal that can be taken off. A seal that can be removed. And in two instances, the seal that is set upon the ears and the hearts and the eyes can be removed from God. It's something that is put onable <laughs> and removable. And at the same time, it is something in the other case that the seal of the wine can be removed by the righteous ones. So for now, barring any hadith uh, interpretations or understandings, any traditions from the Islamic community, when we hear that Muhammad is the Apostle of God and the seal of the Prophets, can we, from the Quran itself, take this to mean that a seal has been placed, that seal is the Prophet Muhammad, and it can never be removed? I would say no. In the case of the Quran, using it in its own dictionary, using it as the highest authority on what it's attempting to say, a seal is something that God can place on and take off. A seal is something that can be placed on by God, and interestingly, on the pure wine that will slake the thirst of the righteous, it can be removed by the righteous. This sealing does not mean something that is irremovable and undeniably permanent. So when someone says, well, he is the seal of the prophets, the Prophet Muhammad is the seal of the prophets. I'm not saying this is the answer, but one could say, yes, and that seal has now been removed. What do you mean you can't remove a seal? Well, according to the Quran, you actually can. And God especially can do so. His hands are not chained up so that he cannot remove this seal. And in some instances, even seals that ostensibly have actually been placed by God can be removed by the righteous, at least according to the Quran itself, independent currently of any other hadiths or tra traditions. This is something that we really have to consider. So, at this moment, I think it's important to understand that very often what's occurring is, and it's understandable, that when someone's saying, well, the Prophet Muhammad is the seal of the Prophets, what has happened is, is a great deal of theory and understanding has been erected around the Quranic verse itself, and then delivered as if it is the Quranic verse. Whereas actually, if we first, as a first step, peel all that back and say, okay, well, let's put that aside for a second, and let's seek our beloved textually in this case, which is the, the meaning and intent of the Quran, independent of any other voices for a moment. Seals, put on, taken off. By God, and it seems, by the righteous themselves, it can be unsealed. So we're going to put this aside. There's going to be further investigation of it and further additions to this concept. I just want to make it understood that this part of how the seal of the prophets is usually communicated isn't what the Quran says. It isn't what the Quran means. And to make this very, uh, uh, very direct, it is important that we don't take our interpretations and our understandings over to the Quran, at least at an initial stage. So now, what we're going to do is we're going to move on, uh, if you will, to what I would call the great drumbeat of the Quran. These are general reasons why, at least for myself, a study of Islam and its concept of utter finality, uh, in the case of the Prophet Muhammad, the traditional interpretation of this, 
appeared peculiar. I began studying Islam before I, uh, I studied the Baha'i faith. And I wanted to say something um, and beg the patience of the friends out there that if it had seemed that there was any religion that would not have made, if you will, this, this an issue, that, that no, no messenger could come after, in, in my mind it just shouldn't have been Islam. Why is this? It's because of what I call the, the great drumbeat of the Quran. We're going to look at passages that will actually attempt to bolster this and make it make more sense. It's that if there really is a, like, a, like a thumping, uh, like a rhythm that actually consistently occurs within the Quran, it's this. God sends his messengers unto a community. He communicates his revelation unto that community. And that community then turns towards them, those messengers, or that messenger, and treats him very, very, very poorly. At times, persecuting, insulting, and even killing that messenger. After which, a judgment actually occurs, and there is a punishment from God under that community. Really, the Quran, which I've read many times, um, has this sort of, if you will, like I said, drumbeat in the background of this text, which is God consistently, constantly attempts to reach out to humankind, and every people is sent to warner, and every nation is sent to warner in their own language. It's a very beautiful picture, and one I wish I'd learned of earlier in, in my life. Uh, this, this sort of drumbeat of this constant attempt of the divine to reach out to humankind, to actually send guidance, to send the light of um, his love and understanding unto humankind is just over and over and over. It was actually quite foreign to me because I had come from, if you will, a certain perspective of Christianity. And I found this actually quite breathtaking when I first began studying Islam, is that there's this constant, if you will, patient attempt of, of God to reach out to humankind, to send his messengers, and that those individuals consistently end up actually being persecuted, rejected, mocked over and over and over, and yet still they bring the message, still they warn the humanity. So it, it seems strange to me that actually Islam suddenly had this feature, which I found quite peculiar, because I was reading the Quran. Uh, not actually the Hadith at the beginning. I was just purely actually studying the Quran itself and read it multiple, multiple times and still do. So this is what I'm going to suggest is this is why I found it actually peculiar because I saw this constant rhythm, this constant drum beat being played by the Quran. And as we shall see, the Quran also consistently stating that there'll be no change in how God relates to his, his people. We're now going to read a series of quotes that are in sequence actually from the Book of Certitude. And this is Baha'u'llah speaking on what I would call this great drumbeat of the Quran. It also brings up another concept, which is about how we investigate. So we're going to begin and we're going to say treat a small section of it and then we'll stop for a second and then we'll read another section and read another section. I believe it's vitally important that Baha'u'llah, of course, gets to speak in this case, and that we do our best at least to understand certain gems that are, if you will, laying within what he has said. So here we begin. Consider the past. How many, both high and low, have at all times yearningly awaited the advent of the manifestations of God in the sanctified persons of his chosen ones. How often have they expected his coming? How frequently have they prayed that the breeze of divine mercy might blow, and the promised beauty step forth from behind the veil of concealment, and be made manifest to all the world? And whensoever the portals of grace did open, and the clouds of divine bounty did rain upon mankind, and the light of the unseen did shine above the horizon of celestial might, they all denied him and turned away from his face, the face of God himself. 
Here Baha'u'llah is like the Qur'an does itself, asking humanity to reflect upon the past, on how in the past so many individuals were waiting the advent of the Promised One of their faith. Yet, though they had sat in prayer, begging for redemption to come, when that figure did shine above the horizon of celestial might, they all denied him and turned away from his face. Imagine, for example, the Jews, from an Islamic perspective, how the Jews and the Christians and the polytheists, the pagans in that day, longed for a relationship and communication from the divine. How from an Islamic perspective, they were hoping to find that promised one, and yet when he actually appeared, how was he treated by the individuals on the Arabian Peninsula? How was his message also therefore treated by individuals outside the Arabian Peninsula subsequently? Reflect. What could have been the motive for such deeds? What could have prompted such behavior towards the revealers of the beauty of the all-glorious? Whatever in days gone by has been the cause of the denial and opposition of those people has now led to the perversity of the people of this age. To maintain that the testimony of providence was incomplete, that it hath therefore been the cause of the denial of the people, is but open blasphemy. How far from the grace of the All-Bountiful and from His loving providence and tender mercies. It is to single out a soul from amongst all men for the guidance of His creatures, and on one hand, to withhold from Him the full measure of His divine testimony, and on the other, inflict severe retribution on His people for having turned away from His Chosen One. And to every discerning observer, it is evident and manifest that had these people in the days of each of the manifestations of the Son of Truth sanctified their eyes, their ears, and their hearts from whatever they had seen, heard, and felt, they surely would not have been deprived of beholding the beauty of God, nor strayed far from the habitations of glory. But having weighed the testimony of God by the standard of their own knowledge, gleaned from the teachings of the leaders of their faith, and found it at variance with their limited understanding, they arose to perpetrate such unseemly acts. That, and that the proofs and evidences for the message of, say, the Prophet Muhammad, was not incomplete because then how could you judge an individual for having rejected it? And this is really important because I think we have to look at this and it's something I often speak on when I have the opportunity to sit with friends of say a Christian or a Muslim background in particular. Try to place ourselves in the time of the Prophet Muhammad, in the time of Jesus Christ, or in the Jews' case, in the time of Moses, or for that matter, in the time of Isaiah, or some of the lesser prophets in Israel, and try to understand well, that first, many of them were treated horribly, that many of these individuals were persecuted, and some of them killed. And why is it that that was happening? Why is it, if you're a Christian, do you think that when the light of the Word of God manifested within the person of Jesus Christ under the people of Israel, why is it that they were willing to persecute and turn aside from him and then kill him when all of their religious perspective and the fervor even in the hum of that time was about the coming of the Messiah? Why is it that the individuals within 7th century Arabia and beyond despite, from an Islamic perspective, longing for the coming of a Redeemer, when he came, turned aside. 
It cannot be that God was unjust, is one of the points of Baha'u'llah, I believe, in here. It cannot be that God withheld the evidence and the divine testimony, because then how could he actually judge them for having rejected it? And then it says this, Had these people sanctified their eyes, their ears, and their hearts from whatever they had seen, heard, and felt, they would not have been deprived of beholding the beauty of God. But, having weighed the testimony of God by the standard of their own knowledge, gleaned from the leaders of their faith, and found it at variance with their limited understanding, they perpetrated such unseemly acts. But this is what we're asking, whether right or wrong, whether true or false, this is what Baha'u'llah is asking the people of Islam and Christianity, Judaism and Buddhism and Hinduism, to do in their assessment of his claim. It's why often I'll say, and said at the beginning of this video, I cannot be asked to abide by the historical, say, interpretations of the Catholic or Orthodox Church, or the Pentecostal Church for that matter, or the Alliance United Church, etc., etc. Why? Because in the days of Jesus Christ, when he came, the what people thought, the limited understanding of the people at that time, made them turn away from Jesus Christ. They had a very specific and precise, under, precise understanding of how Jesus was to, or the Messiah was to return, how he was going to treat the law of Moses, what he was going to do, and the ways that he would interact with humankind. Yet from a Christian perspective, they were wrong. From a Muslim perspective, there was a very, very particular things that, sorry, from a Christian perspective, thinking as a Muslim, there were very, very particular things that a messenger of God should have done must have done and could not do. Yet from their perspective, the Prophet Muhammad did and said those things. So they turned away. And what is it that Baha'u'llah is saying is, is that if you're a Muslim, how did that happen? Did these individuals weigh the testimony of God by their own standard? And did they also glean from the teachings of leaders of their faith a series or sets of understandings and then turn with that limited understanding towards the revelation of the Prophet Muhammad, not only reject it, but perpetrate such unseemly acts. Invariably, that's what you must believe as a Muslim, but that's also what you must believe as a Christian looking at Judaism. Consider Moses. He summoned all the peoples and kindreds of the earth to the kingdom of eternity and invited them to partake of the fruit of the tree of faithfulness. Surely you are aware of the fierce opposition of Pharaoh and its people, and of the stones of idle fancy which the hands of infidels cast upon that blessed tree. So much so that Pharaoh and his people finally arose and exerted their utmost endeavor to extinguish with the waters of falsehood and denial the fire of that sacred tree. Good tree. Mahala then asks us to look at Moses and how he was summoning the people of the earth and he was turned against by the Egyptians and the people of Pharaoh. Likewise, we have to look at actually how Moses himself was treated in the Tanakh when we end up looking at the book of Exodus and we look at the subsequent stories within the Torah itself the Pentateuch, the five books of Moses, we find that Moses was treated very badly, repeatedly, and repeatedly by his own people. And when the days of Moses were ended, and the light of Jesus, shining forth from the dayspring of the Spirit, encompassed the world, all the people of Israel arose in protest against him. They clamored that he whose advent the Bible had foretold must needs promulgate and fulfill the laws of Moses. Whereas this youthful Nazarene, who laid claim to the station of the divine Messiah, had annulled the laws of divorce and of the Sabbath day, the most weighty of all the laws of Moses. Moreover, what of the signs of the manifestations yet to come? 
These people of Israel are even unto the present day still expecting that manifestation which the Bible hath foretold. How many manifestations of holiness, how many revealers of the light everlasting have appeared since the time of Moses? No other reason except that Israel refused to apprehend the meaning of such words as have been revealed in the Bible concerning the signs of the coming revelation. As she never grasped their true significance, and to outward seeming, such events never came to pass, she therefore remained deprived of recognizing the beauty of Jesus and of beholding the face of God, and they still await his coming. Baha'u'llah then turns to the cause of Jesus Christ. That the people rose against him. And what did they say? They said that, well, the Messiah, the one that uh, the Bible hath foretold that would come, must fulfill the law of Moses. He must promulgate it, whereas Jesus Christ, as was shown in the New Testament, and in the Acts of the Apostles, etc., seem to have removed the law of Moses. Then he points to this other facet, that what are the signs of the manifestation yet to come? So the people of Israel are still waiting for the Messiah. And it's something that often isn't really contemplated and then attempted to empathize with from either the Christian or the Muslim communities, or the Baha'i communities for that matter. They're still waiting for the Messiah. Yet he says, how many manifestations of holiness have come? And why did this happen? They refused to apprehend the meaning of such words concerning the signs of the coming revelation. And to outward seeming such events never came to pass. That's what deprived them. So what is Baha'u'llah saying? He's saying, please look back at how this has happened from the passage from the pre-Moses time to the time of Moses and how he was rejected and the reasons why they turned aside from him. Then take what you learned there and now move to Jesus Christ. If you were a disciple of Moses and you met the cause of Christianity and we look at the history, what are the reasons why they were actually rejecting Jesus Christ? And then what does Baha'u'llah do? Expectedly, he turns to the Prophet Muhammad. When the unseen, the eternal, the divine essence caused the day star of Muhammad to rise above the horizon of knowledge among the cavils which the Jewish divines raised against the, him, was that after Moses no prophet should be sent of God. Yeah, mention hath been made in the scriptures of a soul who must needs be made manifest and who will advance the faith and promote the interests of the people of Moses, so that the law of the Mosaic dispensation may encompass the whole earth. Thus hath the King of eternal glory referred in his book to the words uttered by those wanderers in the veil of remoteness and error. The hand of God, say the Jews, is chained up. Chained up be their own hands, and for that which they have said they were accursed, nay, outstretched are both his hands. The hand of God is above their hands. Although the commentators of the Quran have related in diverse manners the circumstances attending the revelation of this verse, yet thou shouldst endeavor to apprehend the purpose thereof. He saith, so the Prophet Muhammad actually comes. And what was the rejection of the Jewish divines? One, no prophet should be sent after Moses. Two, yes, a soul is actually mentioned and communicated that it must come after, but that individual must promote the interests of the people of Moses and take the law of the Mosaic dispensation and spread it across the planet. And in fact, these are the same objections that are actually made from the Jewish divines to Christianity. A response to which we'll have to examine in a different <laughs> video. 
the issue here is, is that, is, was there reason within their scriptures on the surface that they should believe this? And I have to say, yes, there actually was. You shall not add nor take away from the law of Moses, as it actually is said in Deuteronomy. As well, it surely sounds on the surface that when you look at actually passages concerning the Messiah, that he is actually going to spread the law of Moses and he is actually going to promote the interests of the Jewish people. This is what they, if you will, cried foul at with Jesus Christ. And then he t the Baha'u'llah continues. How false is that which the Jews have imagined? How can the hand of him who is the king in truth, who caused the countenance of Moses to be made manifest and conferred upon him the robe of prophethood, how can the hand of such a one be chained and fettered? How can he be convinced as powerless to raise up yet another messenger after Moses? Behold the absurdity of their saying, how far it has strayed from the path of knowledge and understanding. Observe how in this day also, all these people have occupied themselves with such foolish absurdities. For over a thousand years, they have been reciting this verse and unwittingly pronouncing their censure against the Jews, utterly unaware that they themselves, openly and privily, are voicing the sentiments and belief of the Jewish people. Thou art surely aware of their idle contention, that all revelation is ended, that the portals of divine mercy are closed, that from the day springs of eternal holiness no sun shall rise again, that the ocean of everlasting bounty is forever stilled, and that out of the tabernacle of ancient glory the messengers of God have ceased to be made manifest. This here brings this whole issue really to a head at this point in a very, very intense way. Baha'u'llah is stating that in the Quran we find this passage where it's accusing the Jews, uh, the Jewish divines of that time, of saying that the hands of God are chained. And how horrendous this is. And then it says, Endeavor to apprehend the purpose thereof. How can, you, how can God be conceived as being powerless to raise up another messenger after Moses? And then it says, For over a thousand years, they, the Muslim community, Islamic community, have been reciting this verse in response to the Jewish community, and what? Utterly unaware that they themselves are voicing the exact same sentiments. Thou art surely aware of their idle contention that all revelation is ended. The portals of divine mercy are closed, and no sun shall rise again. And this is something that we're going to have to look at increasingly as we move on. Which is, this is what I meant by this issue of the, the, the great drumbeat of the Quran, is that we're told that no change shall happen. We shall see no change in the ways of God. And what does he do? He actually sends messengers. What happens when those messengers are sent is that based on historical inter interpretations of the community and understandings of the people of the time, they r very often actually state that no messenger can be sent after their messenger. Maybe it is true that after the Prophet Muhammad there cannot be, but it is surely the contention of the Christian community toward the Islamic community. That after Jesus Christ, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh to the Father except through him, and that no one can add to the prophecies of this book. There are reasons why the Christian community often will not even look at the Prophet Muhammad. And yet the Christian community itself should turn and treat the concerns that the Jewish community has, which is, well, no prophet's going to come after Moses. I am a disciple of 
Moses, I do not wish to be a disciple of Jesus. This is referencing the Gospel of John, chapter 9, verse 27, if anybody wants to know. So they're stating, they actually state in the New Testament, well, I don't want to be actually a disciple of Jesus. I'm a disciple of Moses. Why? Because they're told they're supposed to hold to Moses. So when a Muslim looks at what they would say to the Christian and to the Jew, is that understanding then taken in and then understood and connected with psychologically and emotionally so that when they hear of a message after the Prophet Muhammad, are they willing to pause and take a breath and treat it as they would ask the Jew to treat Christianity and the Christian to treat Islam? We'll continue on this later. Behold how the sovereignty of Muhammad, the messenger of God, is today apparent and manifest amongst the people. You are well aware of what befell his faith in the early days of his dispensation. What woeful sufferings did the hand of the infidel and erring, the divines of that age and their associates, inflict upon that spiritual essence, that most pure and holy being, how abundant the thorns and briars which they have strown over his path. All treated him as an impostor and pronounced him a lunatic and a calumniator. Such sore accusations they brought against him that in recounting them, God forbiddeth the ink to flow, our pen to move or the pages to bear them. These malicious imputations provoke the people to arise and torment him. And how fierce that torment, if the divines of the age be its chief instigators, if they denounce him to their followers, cast him out from their midst, and declare him a miscreant. Hath not the same befallen this servant, and been witnessed by all? Baha'u'llah here is referencing a part of Islamic history that especially in the West most people are not uh, aware of, which is how horrendously the people of Mecca and the Prophet Muhammad's own extended family uh, treated him. How much was the isolation and the persecution and the horrible and vile treatment towards the Prophet Muhammad in his day? Yet it says, Behold how the sovereignty of Muhammad, the messenger of God, is today apparent and manifest among the people. Baha'u'llah is saying, okay, contrast these two. Look at how much influence the Prophet Muhammad has now. Look at actually how many minarets sing out his call to humanity. And then I want you to look at how the Prophet Muhammad was treated in his day. Let's let Baha'u'llah speak again for a moment. Consider how great is the change today. Behold, how many are the sovereigns who bow the knee before his name. How numerous the nations and kingdoms who have sought the shelter of his shadow, who bear allegiance to his faith and pride themselves therein. From the pulpit top there ascendeth today the words of praise which in utter lowliness glorify his blessed name. And from the heights of minarets there resoundeth the call that summoneth the concourse of his people to adore him. Even those kings of the earth who have refused to embrace his faith and to put off the garment of unbelief, nonetheless confess and acknowledge the greatness and overpowering majesty of that day star of loving kindness such as his earthly sovereignty, the evidences of which thou dost on every side behold. Baha'u'llah here is asking us to pay very close attention to a self-evident theme, which is what? How many sovereigns bow the knee to the name of the Prophet Muhammad? And not just sovereigns in this day who even just pay lip service, but over, over the past 1400 years how the dominion and sovereignty of the Prophet Muhammad has been extolled, his cause wrung out, 
his life studied and he himself beloved by people for nearly a millennia and a half. But to take that fact, which seems often to, to give us a sense of how almost self-evident it was in the time of the Prophet Muhammad, how he was a prophet of God, but then suddenly to remember how he was actually treated. The same thing often happens for all of us when we consider, say, for example, Christ, if we are from the Christian community. We see this you know, massive tidal wave of Christianity rolling over the face of history and really, really conquering Europe. Where from church after church, the bells and hymns were sung in his name. And in some sense, it's interesting because often we confuse this and we infuse it back into the history of Jesus Christ. Where we see this picture of how this rolling, rolling call to prayer that actually constantly encircles the globe in the name of the Prophet Muhammad. And we infuse that glory and grandeur and sovereignty of their cause back into the history of the person of the Prophet Muhammad. And in each case, that's, that's just not what happened. They were actually treated horribly by the vast majority of people. They were persecuted, and in some cases killed. And Baha'u'llah is asking us to remember this fact, because the ability to see the grand and beautiful, if you will, tree, in this current day is very obvious. But we have to be able to see, well, how did they see that great and glorious tree in the seed of the cause of the Prophet Muhammad in his day? How is it they could see that the minarets would sing? How is it they could see that actually all the sovereigns would bow their knee? How could a Jew in the, in the time of Jesus Christ have seen the massive mustard tree in the mustard seed and see that this cause would actually promote the interests of the Jewish people, that it would actually forward the law of Moses, even if not in the way of the Jewish divines believe? It is this that we have to try to understand. That's what actually Baha'u'llah is asking us to do. He continues. It is evident that the changes brought about in every dispensation constitute the dark clouds that intervene between the eye of a man's understanding and the divine luminary, which shineth forth from the dayspring of the divine essence. Consider how men for generations have been blindly imitating their fathers and have been trained according to such ways and manners as has been laid down by the dictates of their faith. Were these men, therefore, to discover suddenly that a man who has been living in their midst, who, with respect to every human limitation, has been their equal, had risen to abolish every established principle imposed by their faith, principles by which for centuries they have been disciplined, and every opposer and denier of which they have come to regard as infidel, profligate, and wicked. They would of a certainty be veiled and hindered from acknowledging his truth. Such things are as clouds that veil the eyes of those whose inner being hath not tasted the salsabil of detachment, nor drunk from the cawthar of the knowledge of God. Such men, when acquainted with those circumstances, become so veiled that without the least question they pronounce the manifestation of God as infidel and sentence him to death. You must have heard of such things taking place all down the ages and are now observing them in these days. It behoveth us, therefore, to make the utmost endeavor that by God's invisible assistance, these dark veils, these clouds of heaven-sent trials, may not hinder us from beholding the beauty of his shining countenance, and that we may recognize him only by his own self. Once again, whether Baha'u'llah is true or not, he is pointing out a historical, sociological fact that he is asking us to really, really consider. 
that individuals are trained in such ways and manners have been laid down the dictates of their faith. And if they were to suddenly discover that a man who with respect to every human limitation is their equal has risen to abolish the established principles imposed by their faith. And then it says, by which for centuries they have been disciplined, every opposer and denier of which they have come to regard as infidel, profligate, and wicked, they would automatically reject him. And this is that same theme of trying to separate the glorious sovereignty manifested currently in our day by such individuals as the Prophet Muhammad, who sovereigns have bowed the knee to literally for over a millennia, and separate that grandeur and sovereignty, the sovereignty where church bells rang all across the European continent and the Asian continent within the Greek uh, Russian Orthodox Church, and actually try to say, well, wait a minute, okay, but what actually happened? What actually happened is if you place yourself in that position, suddenly some individual that you knew may have grown up with claimed to be a radiant light of God in your day. And this individual then actually stands up and actually, what does it say? Abolished establishing principles imposed by your faith. And this is a theme that recurs over and over in the writings of Baha'u'llah and Abdu'l-Baha and the Bab, is that suddenly Jesus Christ took what everyone believed would be an eternal law and upended it. It's something that actually we have to remember that occurred within the life of the Prophet Muhammad when he changed the Qibla or where the ritual sacraments and teachings, both of the Jewish and the Christian faith, suddenly were gone. And a new way of relating to the divine was actually brought forth by the Prophet Muhammad. And that, without least question, these, inf these individuals pronounced those manifestations of God, those revealers of the divine law, as infidel and sentenced them to death. To summarize this first in a series of studies of the concept of the seal of the prophets and finality in Islam, we first looked at a series of quotes. And those series of quotes were statements by Baha'u'llah that actually confirm that the prophet Muhammad was the seal of the prophets and that he was the last prophet, in fact, prior to the great day of God. I stated that in order to investigate this topic, we have to be seekers after the beloved. And that that may encompass or include the putting aside of historical interpretations and understandings of our communities and try to just look at the revelation of the Quran and revelations in general with fresh eyes. That while we may have the Hadith and the interpretations of the Islamic community over time, I cannot make that, at least in the initial stages of our investigation, that important. We then looked at the root words, and uh, of the roots, if you will, of this quote about the seal of the prophets. We looked at the sealer, so to be sealed, having been sealed and sealed. And what did we find out? I believe it's very clear if we're actually just to look at the Quran itself, to look at the Arabic roots and use the Quran as its own definition, as its own explainer of what it means, that seals are things that are put on and they do close. Yet there is no reason to actually state that those seals cannot be taken off by God and that certain kinds of steel, seals like the seal that is placed upon the wine, that the righteous in the end of time in the day of God, actually, will be able to remove a seal and drink of this pure wine. I then looked at uh, a Quran quote, which I had to break up um, <clears throat> from Baha'u'llah, from the Book of Certitude, regarding what I would call this great drumbeat of the Quran. And that drumbeat is that the Quran, out of any of the books I know, 
has this sort of rhythm that moves through it. And that rhythm is that we consistently have messengers of God, out of the love of God, sent unto humankind throughout all these communities. And these messengers of God, as we'll see in the future, regularly will change aspects of the religion, but also will not always appear according to what we have already assumed they should. That our interpretations often run afoul, and that we then persecute these individuals, and then sometimes kill them. What Baha'u'llah says in this series is that we have to be very careful. If we look, he said, consider Moses, consider Jesus, consider the Prophet Muhammad, and it seems like we're hearing the same drumbeat thumping across the landscape. Be careful, for try to separate in your minds the sovereignty and grandeur, for example, that you see in the person of the Prophet Muhammad and his domination of human history for you know, like a millennia and a half from what actually happened and why these individuals rejected the Prophet Muhammad in his day. Why is it that the Jewish divines rejected Jesus Christ? Why did the Egyptians and even his own people actually reject Moses? And try to learn from these stories and be careful. Because many of these individuals were praying for the advent of the Messiah. We're waiting for the coming of the divine messenger. So we'll leave this for now. Thank you very much. And we'll be looking at doing the next series in the coming weeks. Thank you very much. <laughs>